Hello and welcome. My name is Emmanuel Yegon from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm delighted to welcome you all here for our Global Moment Gallery exhibition with our fellow journalists from Cameroon, Rwanda, Slovenia, and the Switzerland. We are a group of photojournalists from 55 countries spanning 16 time zones. We were individually selected by the US Embassy in each of our respective countries. We are participating in a special initiative called a Global Moment in Time, part of the US Department of State International Visitor Leadership Program or IVLP. The IVLP is now in its 82nd year and our group of photojournalists is just one of three Global Moment in Time projects. Now the Global Moment in Time is the first ever IVLP with programming spanning a year. We had a virtual component in the fall of 2021 and still plan to have an in-person program next fall. In between is our bridge program, allowing us to continue to grow and deepen our relationships with one another and the wide audience. These Global Moment Gallery exhibitions are part of that op opportunity for us to connect with each other through our work. And we welcome you here. Now for some housekeeping for our bridge builders, um, let's cross over to our bridge builders, Brittany and Bonnie, over to you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. In addition to being our moderator for today's Global Moment Gallery, Emmanuel Yagon is actually a trained communicator and passionate storyteller with a special focus on smartphone storytelling. He's also the co-founder and communications director at Mobile Journalism Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. We're so glad to have him on the team. And next month, we are looking forward to his fellow Kenyan journalist, Terry Muikamba, joining him as a co-moderator. I am Brittany Link, and along with my colleague, Bonnie Beard, we have the pleasure of being the bridge builders over the course of the year for this impressive group of journalists. We know that you all as journalists and Bordeaux journalists are always on the front line, often in harm's way to tell the story and capture the image, even more so during the COVID era and times of great turmoil. As we see some of their images and hear their stories today, we'll see that very clearly. We honor your work and your sacrifice. Also, as we start today, I will mention that though this is a US Department of State sponsor program, the views expressed by the IVLP participants in this exhibition are their own and not necessarily those of the US government. We're so glad you're all here and I pass over to Bonnie. Thank you, Britt. We are so grateful to see so many of you here. We've got people from the group, other photojournalists, we've got friends and supporters, we've got a couple of mothers, I think, in the audience, um, national program agency officers, we've got community-based members, State Department folks, and we're really grateful you're here to support our folks. It's been great. Emmanuel, back to you, your corner. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Bonnie and Brittany. And once again, welcome everyone for those who are joining us. Uh, we are going to start this conversation with um, Etienne. So Etienne Mainimo is a reporter and photojournalist based in Cameroon. He's a devoted and passionate journalist working with the leading English newspaper in the country, The Post, and freelancing for international photo agencies. As a mentor, Etienne is also a powerful force in the workplace and uses his positive attitude and tireless energy to encourage others to work hard to succeed. Besides being a journalist, Etienne is a filmmaker and a teacher who believes that society can be changed by positively using what is in our environment. So at this point in time, um, I would like to welcome you, Etienne, um, to make your presentation. Kindly, kindly unmute. Okay, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, good evening from Cameroon to everyone. It's a pleasure and uh, uh, to be part of uh, this program. And uh, I would just like to begin straight away with uh, 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 the pictures that will be rolling on the screen. Uh, the picture on the screen is a doctor uh, at the Yaoundé Central Hospital preparing to uh, vaccinate uh, those who um, are coming in for, uh, for vaccination. This picture was taken at the peak 
of um, of the coronavirus uh, vaccination uh, propaganda because there was a lot of uh, uh, issues concerning the vaccine. People were saying that uh, the vaccine we should not take the vaccine, but uh, and then on the other hand, there were equally calls for government officials to spearhead. Uh, the vaccination so that the local population can follow. But I had the opportunity to uh, capture this picture uh, when the Minister of Public Health, you know, took a walking visit to the hospital to see how far uh, a vaccination is going on. And this image was, uh, uh, you know, published in uh, the post newspaper in a bit to show to the local population that vaccination was on and there is need for them to take the vaccination and as well observe other barrier measures in order to uh, to be safe from the coronavirus. Next picture. Okay, this one, uh, these are students who are resuming, uh, resuming uh, classes after uh, five months of uh, stay at home due to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, this was in uh, 2001, it does early around um, June when uh, the corona cases, you know, uh, was so much identified in, in, in the country, especially in Yawen, the capital of Cameroon. So at our, uh, around October 2021, I captured this picture uh, in one government school in the nation's capital, Yawende. And uh, the picture was just to uh, show to the, pop, uh, the population that coronavirus was real and that students are also taking the lead in you know washing their hands applying the various uh, barrier measures in order to uh, to take effective learning and from there you will see a teacher you know uh, supervising and making sure that they uh, they take uh, they do everything possible to washing their hands and you know uh, making sure that they have uh, their are various uh, 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 it things intact to prevent uh, the, the spread of coronavirus. But at this time around, uh, no case of uh, coronavirus was uh, uh, identified in school. Now, this is a picture of uh, a lady in the uh, coast town of the southwest region of Cameroon, uh, you know, uh, ready for uh, preparing fish that will soon be uh, dried. And as you can see, uh, she is not wearing um, a face mask. According to them, coronavirus wasn't real in that part of the of the country. And when I took this picture and asked her a few questions, she told me that um, uh, uh, there were no cases of coronavirus in their own environment, and so they uh, they thought it was that. There is no uh, coronavirus. And I remember that day that I arrived there, uh, many of them were looking at me as if I was uh, uh, something else because I was wearing uh, a face mask and they were shouting from behind that I should not bring coronavirus into their uh, city. So uh, this is in the Southwest region uh, of Cameroon. A, an area mostly inhabited by Ghanaians, Nigerians, Malians, uh, Burkina Faso, or those uh, that shed boundaries with the uh, with the uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is still in the southwest region of Cameroon. Uh, this is in the uh, antenatal uh, uh, operation room where children that are born. Uh, less than nine months are kept. And I had the opportunity to visit them. Uh, the mother, as you see, the mother is sitting uh, on the chair and watching uh, her child while doctors and nurses are, you know, trying to ask her a few questions. And everybody is aware that it's coronavirus. And to show you that despite the peak of the coronavirus, you know, there was still childbirth 
and uh, uh, no child was contaminated because everything was done perfectly to make sure that there was no contamination. There were all barrier measures were being put in place to make sure that the environment is safe. Yes, the next picture is still in the southwest region of Cameroon, where I had the opportunity as to visit. You know, this is an area where uh, there is uh, uh, fishing, and uh, here the population, even though at the beginning of the coronavirus, they had the opportunity to uh, to they had the opportunity to uh, to wear face masks, but. Uh, as time was going on, they were relaxed and then they decided to go on with their normal activities and they are fishing along the, 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 the coast, the, uh, the southwest region where uh, just beside the oil refinery, that's Sonara, uh, a major big company in, the, in Cameroon. And so uh, many of them are, of this day, everybody was, was going on with their normal activities, fishing, as you can see, they're just back from fishing and everybody wants to distribute, uh, uh, to segment them so as to, uh, so that it can get easily to the market. Next picture. Uh, this picture was taken just in the, uh, when there was call for uh, lockdown uh, for two weeks in this uh, all over the national territory in Cameroon, and uh, just a day after uh, uh, the measures were relaxed, I had the opportunity to snap these motorcycle riders who uh, whom uh, who are wearing face mask. Uh, they remember during the the period of the lockdown government insisted that everybody must wear face masks so uh, they did and um it was it was a, a very surprising thing for some of them because they could not believe that they could wear face masks and walk but uh because of the scale of to get in contact with coronavirus and uh, a bit uh, the ability to uh, not to uh, to just to prevent uh, some of them are even moving along with their gel in their bags as they are taking their uh, uh, customers they hand over they apply uh, the gel to the customers to sanitize their hands before uh, they embark so it was really a very huge success at that time um, thank you, thank you very much, um, Etienne. I think Brittany will help us by, you know, sharing the link to more of your work on the platform. Yeah, I think there it is. Um, also, if you have a question, kindly remember to use the raise hand function, um, or just type it up in the in the in the chat box. Although we like that we engage our presenters today, so. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and you know we'll we'll pick on you to ask your question. I have one question as we wait for add the other questions to come in, Etienne. Um, now that you have shared um, different images of you know people in Cameroon during the peak of the pandemic when the vaccinations you know were starting, I am interested in knowing um, how is the situation now and how do you compare you know the situation now in terms of just people. Um, uh, say masking up or, or or following all those regulations compared to you know when 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 it started. Uh, Emmanuel, the situation uh, here in Cameroon has really changed a lot. Uh, as of now, uh, we are having uh, Cameroon, according to the Ministry of uh, Public Health, uh, Cameroon is having a, a recovery rate of ninety eight point two percent. So meaning that. Uh, the recovery rate is fast, and then um, the vaccination rate of, is around eight or nine percent, and then the uh, the 
observing barrier measures, the washing of hands, the sanitizing of hands, wearing of face masks. I think that has really uh, lost as far of as it was in the uh, at first, because in the beginning we could not, you know, move along without hand sanitizers. There were even police officers who were uh, making sure that you have those things. But now it is as if nothing is happening, especially with the the Africa Cup of Nations that just took place. Uh, you know, there was uh, that at. Uh, moment where government equally uh, encouraged the citizens to take the vaccine, but notwithstanding uh, that uh, scary moment uh, disappeared. And um, uh, just of recent, uh, government has relaxed with the recovery rate, uh, government has relaxed the, the measures as um, public gatherings are now authorized, even though they are being organized in strict uh, barrier measures. I want to quote the example of the National Youth Day that was celebrated on the 11th of February. And recently, the, uh, the International Women's Day that was celebrated after two years of suspension due to, uh, to the uh, coronavirus. All right, thank you, thank you um, for that. And also, I think we have another question, Marta from Paraguay. Uh, do you want to ask that question? Just unmute. Hello, I, I just wondered if uh, were there any sanction for not using face mask or not washing the hair, their hands? like jail or prosecuting or something like that? Um, no, there are no sanctions as of now. At first, uh, government had, uh, you know, tried to sanction, but the population was really tough on the fact that uh, no bill was passed in parliament as to what await those who uh, uh, will not wear their face masks, or those who will not uh, wash their hands, those who are not going to sanitize to use their gel. So there was no law that was passed in parliament as regard that, but uh, government went ahead to make sure that they control uh, all movement, especially in, in traveling agencies along the streets, um, movement within uh, uh, the environment, it was really strict. But just like I said, the, the, all those measures have been uh, relaxed and it's as if nothing is happening now because along the streets, as of now, along the streets, you have among 10 people, you you hardly see one person wearing a face mask, except he's going to a government building or is going to uh, the ministry or is going to a, a director's office. That's when the person can wear a face mask. But as of now, everything is just going on. But what uh, is more peculiar about uh, the uh, uh, the issue is that even at the peak of the coronavirus markets were still functioning and there was no contamination rate so it with the imagination of Cameroonians as to the magic that had happened during that time markets were open even though churches uh the gardens in churches were uh were limited but markets were full and people were wearing face masks in the market but Everything was still going on, and there were no contamination rates. So, um, uh, as of now, it's more or less everything is going on well. As if nothing is happening. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, my Nemo uh, from Cameroon. Now, uh, remember that if you still have any questions for the presenters, we will create some time at the end, at the very tail end of uh, this conversation, so that you are able to ask your questions. Now, from Cameroon, we cross over a little bit to Kigali, Rwanda, where Dan, Dan, Dan um, a photojournalist with the New Times, Rwanda. Um, Dan Zengiyumva is a freelance journalist who covers news, sports, and documentary photography. His photos are found in the New Times, Rwanda, an English language newspaper. During the pandemic, his photos have been included in the COVID HQ Africa an accessible destination for stories and information about COVID-19 on the continent and BBC's story of 50 reasons to love the world project. 
Now, um, before you start, uh, Dan, it's just a gentle reminder here that uh, for the presenters especially, let's uh, remember to set our time. But yes, you're welcome for, you know, to share your photos, Dan. How about you? Hello, everyone. I think you are hearing my voice so. So uh, let me quick, let me do a speak. Uh, these pictures you are seeing on your screens, it's a road which is uh, has more traffic jams, but at this time it was a uh, was a in the lockdown. Uh, here was a big time. We never see it as Rwandans, uh, especially for having the pandemic. So here is uh, located in Kigali. Uh, it's an economic zone so where we found many products. So actually, at these days, you can't see this road even in the cafe because uh, here was is was a time COVID uh, was time COVID was spreading pretty much because it was uh, our first lockdown. So in the next pictures, uh, we see a woman buying the face mask. Here to seeing someone wearing mask was uh, supplies things because uh, our government has said uh, people who have to wear our mask was the people who affected with the viruses because uh, here uh, was uh, in the airport and our and our look our, our first our first lockdown was started in, at the end of April's. So here, to seeing someone buying the mask was a uh, was a uh, things which is complicated to people. I don't know if you're seeing the man behind the 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 cells. Uh, he doesn't wear the mask. So this mother was going to buying something in the market called the Kimirongo. So she decided to she she decided to buy mask before. They entered in the in the many peoples, so was a time which is hard as a Rwandans. So in the next pictures, uh, we have some mothers and the, um, her daughters. They are trying to run away of Kigali because uh, here I was in the jury in 2021. Here we was having uh, our third lockdowns in Kigali because. Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, same lockdown at the, at the old countries because uh, gov our government has setting the lockdown depending the way it has uh, large numbers of infections. So here, uh, government has set it in the third lockdown in Kigali only. So the people who was living uh, with the, was living living uh, through the working every day has decided to go back in their village because they, they they were seeing uh, as a Kigari will be hard to them uh, to live in without having jobs because they're lockdowns. So in the next pictures, uh, we have, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, can you, next. Ah, so this is, uh, this mother was uh, it's a local, local leaders in Kenya, Rwanda, we call we call we call them uh, mudugudu. It's a chef mudugudu. It's a, it's a readers who have to lead some little villages. So here they, they are distributing the food relief to the vulnerable family. I don't know if you are seeing the in the back the children who has have powerful uh, body language as in the lockdown because they mo, mo, most of people's was a hunger because they doesn't have uh, the right to go outside to work. So this picture has, has many meaningful to me, especially when you see this kid, they can show you how the COVID was, uh, was in the mind of Rwandans. So next pictures uh, was a uh, was, uh, health, health workers who was conducting the COVID test here uh, after having after having many numbers of COVID, uh, government has set it to start to to take 
random test to like uh, they go into the markets, then make some tests and see how the pandemic is in the country. So they even go to church taking some COVID test to random people. So here was well in the market called the Nyerujian market in Kigari. So next pictures uh, was in August, August 2021, once we are leaving the third, third lockdowns. Uh, here, we leave, we leave the lockdown, but there is some activity which is uh, not allowed to work, like uh, be, like uh, having the, the these people are selling the second hand of the of the of the of the cars because here was it's what they were celebrating because they allowed them to to start working so next pictures are uh, as much big oh here uh here we have a mother's uh, hey, it's a child because this child was a uh, was the first time to allow the middle uh, child to back to school. So here, when you see these pictures of this young, uh, has uh, uh, some difficult of wearing mask properly because there is, it was the first time wearing mask to the child. So next pictures has uh, is a mother who having uh, who receiving his job. The reason why I put these pictures uh, was uh, pictures which is uh, has meaningful because the uh, first time government has said we, we are going to we 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 will not have uh, inoculating the mothers who are pregnant or breastfeeding mothers. So this time was a great time to enjoying vaccinating all the peoples without any conditions about them. Next pictures is a line of. Here, yeah, was the line of people who are, was trying to have some COVID test, uh, uh, excuse me, having uh, COVID vaccines because people were ex exciting to having co uh, to having vaccine because all Rwandans were thinking to having COVID vaccine will help them to fight this pandemic. So, next pictures uh, was uh, ah, maybe time it was running. So, okay, it's the last one. Here is a uh, vaccinating uh, all the women because uh, th th this this part of peoples was uh, comes first during the vaccinating uh, populations because uh, while in the urgent peoples who need to have vaccines. So, I think maybe this time is short. Uh, thank you. I'm waiting your questions. No worries, no worries, Dan. Um, I think we'll we'll create more time uh, at the end yeah. there for people to ask questions. And also, um, because of the fact mm -hmm. that uh, Brittany will share the link to all the rest of the of the images, so that you know the members of the audience will go to the website and see the work that you have you know created during this pandemic um, period. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, that link, Brittany. Now, uh, again, uh, if you have a question, please use the raise uh, hand function. And we'd really, really encourage um, a lot of us, a lot, you know, all of us to ask questions. And uh, I see that in the chat box we have, okay, let's start with Brittany and then we go to Martha again from Paraguay. I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to commend you, Dan, on this fascinating use of black and white photography. It just really brings a different uh, emphasis to what you are showing in your images. Nice work. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brittany. Uh, Marta, do you want to ask? And then we can go to Yusuf from, uh, yeah, we can go to Yusuf. Okay, hello again. In photojournalistic terms, what was the hardest thing that you have to face as a journal, as a photojournalist during the lockdown? Okay, thank you. Uh, the hardest time was uh, being uh, affected with the COVID because uh, we, we, as a all citizen here, we don't having some full information about the the pandemic. So actually, because during the, the lockdown, 
uh, government was allowing the essential work to work, and even journalists. So we were we was allowed to go to the field, taking pictures to showing the people who are staying home how the the situation is outside. So the hard time was uh, was going to taking pictures in the market is because uh, was uh, where we have some many people's going some others people's were not allowed wearing masks properly so actually going outside during the covid was a hard time for us but we we have to work because people need to be informed about this thank you thank you um yusuf i'm here hi everyone um, can you hear me uh, yes um, I need to know um, whether it was like the same in Guinea, Conakry, when there was a lockdown, there was a raid, and the police, the military, or the security personnel were raiding nightclubs, motels. Um, during the day, also, there were checkpoints around arresting people. If you don't wear a mask, you have to pay a certain amount of like $5 equivalent. So I want to know that the, whether you were having this kind of situation in their country like what was happening in Guinea, like they raided a lot of motels, even when they met people sleeping in that motel, we arrest you, even with your girlfriend or your wife, et cetera, they will arrest you and the owners. So I want to know whether this type of brutalism was in your country. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, actually, here in Rwanda, people who doesn't try to wear proper mask was fined uh, 10K, maybe 10K, uh, it's uh, like uh, ten dollars for people who doesn't wear the mask, right? and even people who violating the, the, the curfews, curfew times was uh, also uh, fined ten uh, k too. But uh, people who who has a like driver who was driving during the curfew was also fined the twenty five k. It's a it's a twenty five dollars. So in Rwanda, when you are meeting with the friend, then you, you visit. Some, your friend at home, the government has setting the youth volunteers. It's uh, creating some jobs during the lockdown. Uh, many youth ha had the job through the volunteering as uh, reminding people wear the mask, and uh, they also find them to the market to reminding the people who come to the market to wearing mask well and checking if they will clean their clean their hand well properly so in rwanda we have some kind of uh, finding the people who violating the covid covid uh, regressions thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much. dan you thank you for um answering all those questions well and if you still have any questions, remember we are going to create some time at the end of this conversation. So just keep your question for now. Um, and then, you know, I, I think again in the comment section, we have um, Toko Chikondi from Malawi saying, you know, they like the pictures, especially the one showing a man in a Casper's shop. Um, and also Richard. He's saying, uh, you know, he likes the work that you do. Now let's cross over to Slovenia. Uh, we have Mankitsa Kraniek, who's a freelance photojournalist, wild traveler, and eternal optimist who tries to find magic in sparkling de delicate details with her camera. She's a creative life enthusiast who focuses her efforts on creating photographs and stories that, incre that increase our understanding of people, cultures, and art. She is a witness of time with her camera. She has documented scenes that may once disappear and be lost for future generations. She's an internationally award-winning photographer and author who has been well widely published uh, in the Slovenian and international uh, press. Over to you, Man Kitsa. Take it on. Thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel, for this lovely introduction. And uh, hello to everybody who joined this uh, great session today. Um, so here is the thing. Today, I would like to share with you a project that I was working on in uh, 2020. And actually, when I was checking the date, I just realized that uh, in two days from now, on the 12th of March, uh, actually marks 
two years uh, since Slovenia first announced the pandemic and uh, closed our borders and announced a lockdown in the entire country. Uh, people were not able to travel between uh, municipalities and cities unless it was either for work or emergency reasons. Uh, I was working on this project that I will present to you uh, between March and June in 2020. And uh, I, named it, I named it the City of Sight. Uh, all the pictures uh, were taken in Ljubljana, my hometown, which is usually a very, very touristy city. Um, so imagine uh, the pictures that you will see are usually very crowded as well. The umbrellas have the special meaning that you will see on the pictures and they symbolize people that used to walk down these streets. Uh, this time around, all the streets in March, between March and June were empty because obviously everybody was in quarantine. So a very lively city suddenly became a very silent city and everything became so much different. Okay. So let's go. Um, yeah, this first photo, um, it's a very good representative of what happened when everything went to a lockdown. Slovenia closed the borders and at the same time, basically all the shops, all the restaurants, all the schools and all the public places closed their doors for unknown period. Basically, nobody knew how long this lockdown will take uh, place. And the uh, first pandemic actually ended at the end of May uh, after 80 days of continuous lockdown. However, I've seen so many places written down, uh, it's closed, you know, due to pandemic, we want everybody to be safe. Um, okay. So the second picture, it's, it was made in the city center as well. And it actually represents that COVID-19 virus changed absolutely everything. Uh, this fear for the unknown transport into, into sort of certain fear for health. Nobody was safe from the virus. We didn't know what the virus was and we all tried to stay afloat somehow. This photo was made under one of the most touristic places in Ljubljana where people put their love locks on. So the connection between the picture of the virus, um, it was snippet by somebody and the love uh, has quite a big, I think, um, uh, symbolic meaning. Next picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, as the virus was spreading, you know, we didn't know who or what we are dealing with. Um, we only knew that we need to protect us, ourselves uh, somehow. So uh, hygienic mask and all these protective latex gloves and liquid hand sanitizers were sold out immediately. Um, so a lot of small initiatives of people starting making masks and trying to produce uh, those protective masks started to appear. So um, everybody tried to protect themselves as much as possible. Although now two years later, we know that those um, textile uh, masks were not really useful. However, we tried to protect ourselves as much as possible. Even uh, my mom and I, we uh, sued about 100 uh, masks to help uh, other people uh, to, do, to protect themselves. Um, and obviously, as this virus spread and continued, um, it always had a um, sort of connection to authority. Um, at the same time in Slovenia, also the, the, our politician changed. And so people started to take this virus also as a political statement. And uh, because people were powerless, um, they were facing or we were facing visible enemy. Uh, and local authorities also were focused on protecting the people um, but people didn't really believe uh, our politicians too much um, as the virus was spreading and there were numbers rising. Um, so 
so yeah, two years later, you know, now we have more knowledge and we also know our government a little more. Um, yeah. So not only that um, all the public places were uh, shut down for uh, an unknown period of time, also the public transport system was banned during the first lockdown, all the bus train stations were closed, and basically all the people, um, the backbone of society who had to work, um, they had to find their own ways to share the rides with their co-workers. Uh, however, in uh, May 11th, uh, buses and public transport uh, started running again. Um, however, they like they put all these signs on buses and trains that people need to distance themselves uh, to ensure, you know, that uh, they will stay safe. Um, not only that um, you know the buses uh, were stopped and everything at the same time um, people uh, took a lot of tests a lot of testing centers appeared and also um, you know they were about in the peak of the the pandemic even 120,000 rapid antigen test samples a day were taken which is a very large number for Slovenia um, these uh, umbrellas that you can see they could represent people standing in line for a test because those were people actually standing in lines you know um and i even i remember how is, i was always afraid taking a test and if i will get a positive result or what what will happen next um okay um while you know People were locked in, then the, the lockdowns were, were banned. However, um, this stress, this discomfort, this, this anger, you know, that happened during pandemics uh, left a lot of people, you know, uh, in stress. Um, that's why people started uh, to express uh, this, all, all these feelings through graffiti that appeared all over um, my city, uh, Ljubljana. Uh, the picture that you see means Človek Človeku Corona, which actually means uh, human to human Corona, which somehow I interpreted uh, that it could indicate the human to human transmission of the virus. And obviously Corona, uh, we know there is a beer with this name, but the, the, the Corona actually became a word uh, that we use in, in our everyday vocabulary. And it's actually a term for a COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, okay. I am really, really sorry. I have to cut you short at this. I just, but, uh, yes, okay. just one more thing. Um, oh. I would like to finish with this photo because I think it has a quite a powerful uh, message. And actually, simultaneously, uh, as this virus spread, this um, great um, street artist appeared. Uh, in our city and started to put all these stickers around the city and it actually um, you know suggests to people to to push the button to change the world to try to do something to uh, you know to, to change uh, this madness that it's going on um, in the world <laughs> so all right thank you. <laughs> thank you very much those are really powerful images there uh, Mankitsa um, I'm, I'm just interested to know um wh why did you decide to you know juxtapose those different images why what informed the style um uh, and they're really really you know powerful images that you have put there uh, even even independently you know they, they would still be be powerful messages but you know um you have done this thing that uh you, the, the thing you've done with the, with the images is is really cool i think um please inform us the, the reason behind that as as we pick other questions yeah, thank you so much for the question, uh, Emmanuel. So uh, here is the thing. I was thinking like, okay, I could do a document. I'm, I'm mostly documentary photographer, right? So uh, I was thinking maybe I could document other people with masks and so on. But then I thought like, okay, maybe I could do another project, you know, that shows no people um, and gives maybe an impression of what's going on in the world without seeing the exact images of masks, of hand sanitizers and so on. 
And as I was walking through my hometown, which is really, you should all come once to visit. It's so lively. It's so beautiful. And it was so, I mean, so empty. There were no people. I saw these umbrellas and they reminded me of people. They were all, you know, standing there. They looked so sad and, and it looked like they're sighting, like, you know, that's why I also named my project the way I did. Um, so that's why I decided like, okay, I could decide to go for umbrellas. There are a lot and they are lively again. Now the pandemic is almost over, I hope. Now all the umbrellas are open again, you know, life is here. So they were closed and I decided, okay, I will go with the images that are um, visible to everybody. Uh, and then I just decided, yeah, to put them together and everybody who looks at them can make their own story, basically. Thank you, thank you. That was a brilliant, a brilliant way of um, sharing your work. Um, I think we have a question from Sandra from Germany. Do you want to unmute? Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have the question, have you tried uh, to pu publish the photos? Um, no, only on our website, like the Global Away Time, uh, but I, I didn't really like they, they appeared in another gal online gallery, but uh, not in any of the media. So uh, it's a great new approach. I like it. Thank you so much, Sandra. <laughs> All right, um, <clears throat> we will have to hold all the other questions now because of the time factor, but thank you very much, uh, Mankitsa, for sharing your incredible work. Uh, right about now, we want now to go all the way to Basel in Switzerland, um, to Ronald Schmidt, who is a freelance photographer represented by 13 Photo in Zurich, Switzerland. He was born with a camera in his hands, uh, Schmidt currently works for national and international newspapers, magazines, companies, and organizations. And in 2021, he won the second prize in the World Press Photo Contest, uh, gen general news stories for his work, Cross Border Love, about couples in love and friends meeting at the closed Swiss German borders during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I can't wait to see some of those images. Uh, so take it away, Ronald. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, Brittany will share the, the screen. Yes, here we are. Okay, uh, when, when the crisis started, I just have been, did come back from, from Ukraine where I did documentaries on the, on the war in Donbass. And I came back and then this Corona crisis started and I, I wasn't able anymore to publish my, my photographs from, from Ukraine. And, but I thought, uh, well, now uh, we got a crisis here in, in Central Europe, so let's try to, to, uh, to make something out of it, a documentary work. And uh, it was quite, in, in Switzerland, the, the hospitals, and they were very restrictive to let people in. And I thought, well, and there are already so many pictures of photographs from hospitals and things like that that I uh, choose to work on the impact of, of uh, the, the corona of the coronavirus on the, the impact on ordinary people, as I usually do it whenever I do other works. When, when I go to war zones or whatever political work, I, I always uh, uh, want, want to make a work on about ordinary people which are impacted by the, by the big politics. So, <clears throat> Uh, I, in the beginning, I, I also went to the empty cities and started document um, my city, Basel. And one day, they, they started to close uh, the borders to to France, Italy, uh, uh, Austria, and Germany. And from the day one, when they closed the border, uh, by the way, that was the first time after World War II that Switzerland closed the border to to its neighbors. So I, and I, I live at the border. I live at the borders to to France and Germany. So I, I, I started to walk the borders and document, uh, make documentations on this issue. So what we see here is a couple on the first day of the of the border crossings, 
crossings, closings, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, go to the next, next picture, please. Brittany, yeah, okay. Uh, and, and here you see uh, the way how they closed the biggest part of the, of the border. So this is in the forest. Uh, there's a, a path next by, and they, they put up everywhere these plastic banderoles. But I must tell you that in, in the biggest parts of the borders, th there was not really a visible closing because they just didn't have the manpower or the materials to close all, all the, the, the whole landlines with this with these banderoles. Maybe we go to the next. Yes, and, and one day I, I heard in the news that uh, at the border to Germany, that couple, separated couple, would meet at the border fences. So, and then I started to make walks along along the Swiss-German border, and I drove also to to the other side of Switzerland, to the Lake of Constance, where where is uh, uh, the next the, the next land border to to Germany, because in in between Basel and Constance, there there is the River Rhine, and and People couldn't meet in the River Rhine, right? So, <clears throat> uh, and, and this picture I took close uh, from where I live. Just the, the, the woman is uh, the girlfriend of the man in the foreground. She's living in Germany and, and he's living in Switzerland. Maybe we go to the next picture. Yes, that's a similar situation. You see, it, it's, not, it's quite close from the, the place I took the first picture. You see again this, this plastic ribbons around the, the apple trees, and the guy you see on the picture it's a, a man from from Germany, and he he drove four hours with his car to see his girlfriend on the Swiss side. The the, the woman lives in, in in also in Basel, close to Basel, and they they right below right underneath the plastic ribbon they spread the the sheet and and they even marked uh, the the border. On, on the sheet with a pen, just just out of, <laughs> just to, to make some fun on the whole situation. Maybe we go to the next photograph, please. <clears throat> uh, that's what that was another thing. Um, everywhere in Switzerland in the cities, they set up these uh, gift fences. So people who who had problems because of the pandemic because they couldn't work anymore or had social problems, economic problems. So people could bring presents or, or whatever clothes uh, to the fence, which the people could take away when, when, they, when they were in need of something. There were also a lot of hygienical articles or whatever. Let me go to the next, next picture. It was another subject was loneliness, uh, especially elderly, peop elderly people got into isolation. Uh, and, and that had, had quite a, uh, for many, quite a psychological impact. So it's a lady waiting on a, on a tram station. That's another pictures of this series. A man sitting in his flat and, and watching the surroundings through his uh, binoculars. Maybe the next picture. And it was also something very special that many people went into the forests and built their little cottages or huts with wood or, or set up their tents to, to live in, just to live in the tents for, for a certain time. They, they got themselves in, in, in isolation and lived, lived there for months. So when you took a walk into the forest, sometimes you just saw cottages. Yeah, that's the next picture. That was carnival last year. There was no carnival, but some, some carnivalists came out and fitted themselves with this plastic just, it, it, it was just a kind of protest action against uh, the, the, the carnival couldn't happen. So the next one, please. Uh, what also uh, was strange for me was this uh, di di diversion of the society. You know, there were, were a lot of adversaries against vaccination and many people made demonstrations against uh, the government because of the of, of, of all these uh, laws which came. And this is a picture of one of these uh, anti-vax demonstrations in Switzerland. They, they said Switzerland became a dictator, dictatorship. And so uh, 
in Switzerland, we had two referendums because of the COVID laws. So, and, and in the two ref referendums, uh, the COVID laws were, were always accepted by the majority of the, of the population. Yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those powerful images, Roland. And I think um, as, what's her name? As uh, Patricia from Virginia is saying, your photos remind us, you know, that the borders, borders are artificial divisions, uh, that we are really all, all, all the same. And I like the way you even, you know, name this project, that it's love across, across, across borders. Uh, good work, good work there. Now, um, a few questions here. We have uh, Yusuf, you want to ask your question? Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Your photos were very nice. Uh, my my question is why most of your photos you focus on the fences because most of about the border crossing and um, I didn't see I mean like most people wearing masks I mean close up photos I don't know why didn't you take some of these photos or you have them just because of the time you did not provide us with them but I just want to know why because it's quite different from the photos I was expecting more. I don't know why. Can you just explain something about that? Uh, I, I tell you something about the mask. So in Switzerland, we were, we were never really forced to wear, to wear masks outside. So when, when you went out, you, you, you didn't have to wear your mask. There, there was a certain times when you had to wear it in, in crowded surroundings outside. But, but we had two masks inside and, and when we went shopping or in public transport. So everybody wore a mask, but, but usually not outside. Uh, and I, I choose the fence at the, the, the border situation because the borders are, are a very constant thing throughout my whole, whole photographic work. So it doesn't matter where I go, it, it has always something to, to, to do with, with borders. Uh, with land borders, also borders in the head of people. So uh, the question of enemy, why, why, why do we have enemies in our head? You know, it, it's a kind of, of how people are educated or influenced by, by politicians also. That, that's also something that appears always in my work. And, and borders, I think in, in Europe now we have, usually the borders are all open to most of the countries. So you don't have to, to show your passport when you go to Italy or to France or to Portugal or wherever you, you don't the borders are open you just go walk to the to, to the other country and for me and, and I think for most of the people this is so precious you know and and we have to take uh, we have to be nice to our neighbors and to, to to the other countries to to have this luxury of open borders when, when I go for instance for instance to to Asia or Africa or wherever the pro pro procedure to cross the borders, it, it can take hours. <laughs> and here in Europe, you just cross the border. And I think it's so nice, no? And we have to take care of that. Um, thank you, thank you, Roland, for that. Perhaps I want to open this up now to all um, the presenters. And I'll start with uh, my question, and then I'll open it up to um, the audience so that you can ask questions to all the presenters and you know, we can spend the next few minutes in responding, um, in asking these questions and then responding to the, to the questions. Now, uh, what would you say um, was the most fulfilling um, moment or the most fulfilling image that you have taken uh, during this pandemic? It could be related to you know, um, it leading to some impact of some sort, but what would that be? Uh, what would that moment be for, for you? You ask who? You can start with Man Kitsa. Okay. Oh, Roland, okay, if you're ready. Okay. No, just go on. I have to, I have to think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Man, Man Kitsa. Oh my God, I was, I was thinking the same as Roland. <laughs> <laughs> Am I there? Um, uh, hello, what? Manu. Yes, yes, my name, my name, I think is ready. Okay, yes, uh, yes, I there is a remarkable picture which I did not show, which did not because of time, 
I had the opportunity to uh, to to take photos of um, those who are suffering from kidney uh, failure, kidney problems during the heat of the pandemic. They were they had uh, organ uh, they organized a sit down strike in front of uh, one of the big hospitals here in Yaoundé, and it was really really. Uh, devastating. I think, yes, that's the picture. You see elderly, the children were sitting in front, uh, that's across the route, that is in front of the military, uh, sorry, the, in front of the uh, university teaching hospital, one of the biggest uh, hospitals in Yawandi, and they were asking for government to provide them with uh, uh, machines, and according to them, they said the only four machines were available for 200 patients. So uh, I think that was one of the remarkable pictures that I took during the pandemic because it was really very shocking to see uh, fragile uh, people having uh, that particular illness and coupled with the fact that it was the pandemic outside, which was really very devastating, and they said they were protesting. It's true, the uh, government had said uh, they would do something, but uh, to the best of the of knowledge, things are still going very slowly to provide those uh, people with the uh, dialysis machines. Very powerful image there showing that, you know, um, all these other problems not, did not stop because because of the pandemic. Thank you so much, my Nemo. Um, who's next? All right. Okay, I, I, I will yes, go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was thinking like, I, I made a lot of photos during um, pandemic and I, I don't think I have one photo that I could choose, you know, as the, the, the photo from uh, the pandemic. But what I, I realized is like, I did a lot of photos outside in the nature and I really recognize how much nature in just two years, you know, recovered. And I think maybe for me, that is one of the most outstanding revelation or how do you, how do you call it, you know, that to see that nature can always recover. And it gave me a very big inspiration that people recover too, even when bad things happen, you know. So maybe that was something I was thinking about a lot uh, during uh, this time. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Brittany, for sharing uh, a screen to you know show us the work of these billion photographers. Um, Dan or Roland, who wants to go first? On yes, I, if it's okay, I can go ahead. Um, I, I, I also I also I don't have one picture, but it's maybe the sum of most of my pictures. And what, what kind of impressed me most is how easily can you can get a, a society out of balance. I, I don't tell you a secret when when I tell you that Switzerland is a very rich country with uh, usually not many not the same problems other countries have. We, we speak of luxury problems, you know. But it, it took so little to take to to get out of the balance the whole society, and 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 many people are not ready just to to give a little, something little just to 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 make a little bit to make a step back for for the wealth of other people, and that that impressed me quite a lot negatively, I must say. But I think it's, that's maybe the the sum of of my photography I, I took. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. And finally, Dan, on that same question. So actually, to, to my side, I don't, th I don't th think I have some one picture that can say that, because uh, actually, as a journalist here in Rwanda, uh, we don't have uh, all access to cover about the COVID. So actually, what I, I can say, the pictures, I can it can be related to the stories you are telling them, because uh, here, uh, for me, we were focusing to getting the story from the citizen. So I don't think I, I can sing or I have some one pictures can say or say it all because uh, we always focusing on the stories of people. Maybe I can say it will be on. It will depend on the stories we have because 
was so many about here. I don't know. I can't say it. It's all right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see that we have about six minutes, but I want to ask maybe one question. And these will vary because I know um, all of you have different years of you know experience that you've been doing photography. But what is the lesson that you think um, if you were to hand it over to the next to the next generation of photographers, what is the one lesson that you have picked from the COVID nineteen pandemic? In 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 very few words, what is that lesson that you would you know hand it down to to the next um, generation of photographers? Uh, can I start? Yes. Uh, so what what I can say, actually, depending the co the COVID situations, I think uh, coming generation really will refer to our works because uh, we had some many stories about COVID. I think uh, our archive will help them to know what what they have to do and uh, what 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 happened what, since they are they are since they are waiting to come to this uh, career. So I think our archive will help them, especially to the upcoming generations. Thank you very much. Um, quickly, who is next? My Nemo. <clears throat> yes, uh, I think um, one lesson which the next generation needs to understand from what we are doing is that, um, at least from the pictures that we have had, uh, it will help to uh you know it will help to to tell them that they need to be prepared at any moment uh it's it's, it's true that during this the, the the start of the pandemic it was very difficult to wear face masks and was even even difficult to comply to the health uh, measures that were put in place but with the, the chronological uh sequence of the pictures i think uh, the next generation will follow it to know that this is what happened and this is how they're supposed to prepare themselves for any, we are not praying that any pandemic should come again, but in case it comes, they need to be very vigilant and very careful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mankitsa? Yeah. Um, for the next generation of photographers, well, I, I would tell them just to try to find a different angle and you know not only like the the stories uh the front stories are important but also try to find stories that are behind the scenes because sometimes those stories are even more powerful so um yeah try also try to find magic you know even in like I said earlier, even in bad things, there there are always also good stories, and this is what <laughs> it only uh, drives us further. Thank you, thank you so much. And finally, Roland. Yes, I I think I will keep it short. Uh, it doesn't matter what happened. Uh, don't become depressive. We as photojournalists, we 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 should work what whatever with with whatever will happen or happens and. We are in a luxury situation that we can work on, even in crisis crisis situation. Or and 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 to work as a photojournalist is also a good chance to go in depth of of the problem. So don't get depressive. Just do your work. <laughs> That's my my advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time that you've shared with us and thank you for the incredible congratulations. I mean, uh, you have done a really good job in, you know, covering the pandemic and working with the environment that has been, you know, very volatile and keeps changing, but you have uh, done what you've been able to do. So kudos to that and keep doing that. Thank you so much even to the participants who've been able to ask questions and engage our presenters today. And I think from Nairobi, I would say thank you so much and look forward to seeing you all again in the other first Thursday in April. And uh, up to this point, I would like to hand it back uh, to Brittany and Bonnie. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. I, this is just, I, I can't even, I'm having trouble finding words, which is why I would like to ask those of you that are still on the call before you hang up, 
I want you to throw into chat just one or two words about how you feel right now. I know that there are many things that I wanted to say, but without tilting anyone, just throw into chat the words that, that come to mind. Inspired, responsible, um, hope. Um, I know Mankitsa mentioned the word hearts, motivated, awed. This is all as a result of your photographs, folks, and your presentations need to help each other, um, strong, um, more confidence, and hope. Hope is a big one. Hope is a big one. Encouragement, magic. I love that. I caught that word. I wrote it down. Hope again. Hope is, is a big one. Humanity. I love the comment that was made by Roland. I think that you know, or someone wrote that borders are just something that we create, that humanity flows across regardless. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you being here, beauty and people. Um, we thank you all so much for being here. We would like to ask the participants to stay on for some few announcements. And um, again, we're so grateful for the audience and for these incredible moments with these photographers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks to our presenters. Thanks to Emmanuel. And thank you all for coming. Um, and we do have these events usually once a month. So for those of you who are on our listserv and are here, Keep looking out for announcements coming through about the ones that will be public, and we'll be happy to have you here for those. Thanks again to all the folks who tuned in today.